My guest tonight has been at the forefront of the music industry for the last decade, from his days in Nirvana to his current gig as the lead singer of the Foo Fighters, their current album, There Is Nothing Left to Lose, just one best rock album at Wednesday's Grammys. Please welcome Dave Grohl. Dave. <laughs> Was I watching an old uh, video of Nirvana where the big guy threw his guitar up and whacked his head? That was the 92 VMA MTV <laughs> Music Awards. Where bass player, what he, he sometimes at the end of a show, we're just trashing shit and fucking everything, and drums are breaking. And Chris would do this thing, he's six foot seven and a half. He'd take the bass and he'd throw it 20 feet up in the air and catch it. And so at this Video Music Awards thing, throws it up in the air. Blinded by the light, <laughs> smacked down on the head, <laughs> winds up on the floor, and I didn't realize what happened. And afterwards, everyone's coming up to me, where's Chris? Where's Chris? Where's Chris? I'm like, I don't know, what's wrong? Dude, he knocked himself out with the bass. <laughs> he knocked himself out with the bass. So we're all running around looking for him and behind this super arena dome thing. And I'm, I could picture him, like, in the fetal position in a broom closet with a huge lump on his head, like, Aah. and I run into this one room and I open the door and there's Chris with this huge lump on his head drinking champagne with Brian May from Queen, just like. <laughs> you know, when Cobain looks over at you and says, "Dude, that's fucked up," you, uh, it's you the real really deal. Made a <laughs> it's the real deal. Now you won a Grammy the other night, and I'm wondering, uh, you know, part of the charm of Nirvana, the Foo Fighters, is uh, sort of. Uh, I always detect some sort of suitable degree of indifference about those sort of trappings. And I wonder what, I, I know you don't want to, obviously well, you don't want to accept something and then make fun of it. I'm not asking you to do that, but does it mean that much The thing, the one thing I was most proud of was that, and I said this in the speech when we accepted it, we made this album in my basement. Three total burnouts <laughs> <laughs> building a studio. You build it? Yeah, it's easy, some, I guess. I mean, we just... No, Bob I mean... Vila, this old studio? Yeah, book we were... Exactly. <laughs> no, we just kind of <laughs> winged it, you know? We had people from Los Angeles telling us, no, 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 you don't want to build your own studio. Like, you're going to make the White Album. We're never going to see you again and all this shit. And so people were telling us, you got to hire an acoustic engineer. you got to do this. you got to do that. And we are just like, really? I thought maybe you could just soundproof it with egg cartons and then just put up mics. And, and we did it, and we made the album for a, nothing. So it didn't have a lot of trappings to it. You proved you can, the hard, or I don't want to sound like Huey Lewis, but the harder rock and roll still is about just, just doing it yourself, man. And it was the greatest thing. And that's, I was so proud that from ground up, we built the studio, we recorded and produced it with our friend Adam, super mellow. All we did all did just drink Coors Light, play basketball, have a barbecue, and then, does that sound any good to you? Like, it was like, <laughs> it wasn't like the conventional route. And then, and then all of a sudden it gets a Grammy. And I was like, awesome. Like, it's, you know, like, just to everybody, it was great. So, but you know, you watch these shows anymore and uh, there's not much rock and roll left. I mean, there's a lot of little niche markets, but I'm saying yeah. actual rock and roll. I was, I was thanking God that night that at least Bono and them got out there and still, Absolutely. you know, rocked. It, it's, uh, well, I think that I think that rock music is still alive, although, you know, things go in cycles where rock music can be the biggest thing in the world because people need they feel the need to have a human connection with the artist. Like, wow, that guy looks like the dude who pumps gas at the Texaco down the street from my house, you know, <laughs> and then and then you get sick of that and you think like, oh, everybody's fucking ugly and everybody looks too normal. And then you get Marilyn Manson. And then you're like, cool, awesome. It's, so you're excited. And then after a while, you're like, wow, do people make music anymore? And then, it, and then some kid pops out of his garage making music that means something. So I think right now what's happening is we're kind of in this Vegas showboat limbo, you know, where... You don't go to a show to see a band. You don't go to a show to see 
like a concert, you go to a show to see like Phantom of the Opera. You know, it's like you go to you, it's Andrew Lloyd Webber rock. You there know, you go. Sort of. Well, talking about that human connection and the kid at the Texaco station, it would seem to me that the industry is in a an odd, uh, dangerous. Kids are out there thinking, hey, th you know, for once we're not getting screwed, we're kind of getting let in, right. and this is cool. I can't, I, you know, I talk to kids, they can't believe it, you know, my, my son's young friends, that they could actually. And now, you know, I thought that Lars guy was taking a big, dangerous step. Now, you got to admire him for following his, his heart, but well, you it's know a what? pretty dangerous step to disconnect from those kids. I Music should be available to anybody that wants to hear it. I think that that there should be no such thing as a price tag on music. Okay, maybe there's a price tag on the package that you buy. You know, you pay $13 for a CD, you get the artwork, you get the jewel box, you get the friggin' sticker, you get the whole nine, whatever. But I don't want to turn on my fucking radio and have to put a nickel in it to hear Metallica. Like, I don't want to have to yeah. pay to hear music. Like, uh, I mean, and you know what, I understand where most, where some people can come, where some people come from when they say, Napster is taking money away from me. Napster is hurting my lifestyle, or Napster is, I don't have food in my refrigerator because Napster's got my song all over the internet, no one will buy my demo tape. But you know what? When it's someone that sold 50 million records and they got 50 million fucking dollars and they're bitching about pennies, Fuck you, man. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Okay. You know, and, and I mean, yeah. I'm, I'm fortunate. Like, I'm, I am lucky enough, I am fortunate enough to have been in a band or two that actually make a living, you know? So, yeah, see? thank you very much. Now, listen, I can tell you, I can tell you, I, I don't see you drumming as much now, but I can tell you they have, still have the drum chops because every time you make a salient point, you hit that bass pedal. They're flams, dude. <laughs> <laughs> We've got a phone call for you. We've got line three, Charles from College Point, New York. Charles? Yeah, I just wanted to ask uh, if uh, if someone like Elton John can embrace somebody like Eminem, how come everybody else has such a problem with him? How come everyone has a problem with Elton John? No, with Eminem. <laughs> Fucking tiny dancer, man. <laughs> <laughs> Muskrat love. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. What do you make of the Eminem thing? It seems like you know much to do man. about nothing. There's always been somebody who feels like they have to shock and. Absolutely. I don't know. It it's, wasn't to me. It didn't. I mean, I know of all the controversy. I know all the people Eminem pissed off, and I didn't really pay attention to it. But the best part was that we were doing press behind the after we got the Grammy, walked through the press lines, and these and we were getting the Eminem Elton John question. Every interview, we're talking like 50 interviews in a row. And I said to the guy before we went on to do the interview, I said, man, if they fucking ask me that Eminem, Elton John thing, I swear to God, I'm gonna smack somebody. This is insane. Like, I, what, do you think I give a shit? Like, I, I can understand like, what Quincy Jones. What do you think, Quincy? Well, I think, you know, me, it's like, fucking, I don't give a shit. <laughs> but anyway, they said the people, the people who were like getting the, the artists ready to step up to the interview, platform. I said, you know, if someone asked me that question, I'm going to freak. And they said, you know what the best was the gospel groups would go up and the journalists would ask them, do you think Eminem's going to go to hell? <laughs> they actually asked these questions to some of the gospel artists. That's yeah, those in Congress. So coupling. that's more interesting. Charlie, he's gone. Uh, well, I think Eminem's going straight to fucking hell. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, Johnny from Hermitage, Tennessee. What's your question, John? Hey, what do you think? Uh, well, Dennis, I want to say I love your show, and David, I love your music, man. It's really cool. Thanks, Johnny. And my <laughs> question is... Johnny's a cool name. Johnny, you're rad, man. <laughs> All right, dude. What's up, Johnny? Well, my question sort of, well, changed because of some of the topics you brought up. So what do you feel... <laughs> has made a lot of the music styles mesh together like they have. Did you get that? All right, Johnny, good talking to you. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> oh, 
Earl, I must tell you, man, the highest compliment I could pay somebody in rock and roll is to say, I think you got a lot of Neil Young in you. That's who you're well, I do, I, I do uh, have uh, a lot of... Uh, <laughs> I need, I, need, I need a lot of iconoclasts in my guys. There's nothing worse than a radical with a publicist, and I dig your vibe, man. It's good to meet you. Stay <laughs> rolling.